Part Four of Nonsense by H. Beam Piper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Four. The two sixty-foot collapsium armored turtles settled to the ground and went off contragravity. The ports opened and things began being floated off on lifter skids. Framework for the water tower and curved titanium sheets for the tank. Anna de Jong said something about hot showers and not having to take any more sponge baths. Howell was watching the stuff come off the other landing craft. A dozen pairs of four-foot wagon wheels with axles, hose and bundles, scythe blades, a hand forge with a crank-driven fan blower, and a hundred and fifty-pound anvil, and sledges and cutters and swags and tongs. Everybody was busy and Mom and Sonny were fidgeting, gesturing toward the work with their own empty hands. "'Hey, boss, what are we going to do?' He patted them on the shoulders. "'Take it easy.' He hoped his tone would convey none urgency. "'We'll find something for you to do.' He wasn't particularly happy about most of what was coming off. Giving these savants tools was fine, but it was more important to give them technologies. The people on the ship hadn't thought of that. These wheels, now, machined steel hubs, steel rims, tubular steel spokes, drop-forged and machined axles, the savants wouldn't be able to copy them in a thousand years. Well, in a hundred if somebody showed them where and how to mine iron and how to smelt and work it, and how to build a steam engine. He went over and pulled a hoe out of one of the bundles. Blades stamped out with power press, welded to tubular steel handles. Well, wood for hoe handles was hard to come by on a spaceship. Even a battle cruiser, almost half a mile in diameter, he had to admit that. And they were about two thousand percent more efficient than the bronze scrapers the savants used. That wasn't the idea, though. Even supposing that the first wave of colonists came out in a year and a half, it would be close to twenty years before Terran-operated factories would be in mass production for the native trade. The idea was to teach these people to make better things for themselves, give them a leg up, so that the next generation would be ready for contragravity and nuclear and electric power. Mom didn't know what to make of any of it. Sonny did, though. He was excited, grabbing Howell's arm, pointing, saying, Go, go. He pointed at the wheels, and then made a stooping, lifting, and pushing gesture, like a wheelbarrow. That's right. He nodded, wondering if Sonny recognized that as an affirmative sign, like big wheelbarrow. One thing puzzled Sonny, though. Wheelbarrow wheels were small. His hands indicated the size and single. These were big and double. Let me show you this, Sonny. He squatted, took a pad and pencil from his pocket, and drew two pairs of wheels. Then put a wagon on them, and drew a quadruped hitched to it, and a svant with a stick walking beside it. Sonny looked at the picture. Svants seem to have pictorial sense, for which makes us thankful, and then caught his mother's sleeve and showed it to her. Mom didn't get it. Sonny took the pencil and drew another animal with a pole travoice. He made gestures. A travoice dragged. It went slow. A wagon had wheels that went around. It went fast. So Lillian and Anna thought he was the village half-wit. Village genius, more likely. The other peasants didn't understand him and resented his superiority. They went over for a closer look at the wheels and pushed them. Sonny was almost beside himself. Mom was puzzled, but she thought they were pretty wonderful. Then they looked at blacksmith tools. Tongs. Sonny had never seen anything like them. Howell wondered what the savants used to handle hot metal probably big tweezers made by tying two green sticks together. There was an old Arabian legend that Allah had made the first tongs and given them to the first smith, because nobody could make tongs without having a pair already. 
Sonny didn't understand the fan-blower until it was taken apart. Then he made a great discovery. The wheels and the fan and the pivoted tongs all embodied the same principle, one his people had evidently never discovered. A whole new world seemed to open before him. From then on he was constantly finding things pierced and rotating on pivots. By this time Mom was fidgeting again. She ought to be doing something to justify her presence in the camp. He was wondering what sort of work he could invent for her when Carl Darver called to him from the door of the headquarters hut. "'Mark, can you spare Mom for a while?' he asked. "'We want her to look at pictures and show us which of the animals are meat cattle and which of the crops are ripe.' "'Think you can get anything out of her?' "'Sign talk, yes. We may get a few words from her, too." At first Mom was unwilling to leave Sonny. She finally decided that it would be safe and trotted over to Darver, entering the hut. Dave Questel's construction crew began at once on the water tank, using a power shovel to dig the foundation. They had to haul water in a tank from the river a quarter mile away to mix the concrete. Sonny watched that interestedly. So did a number of the villagers who gathered safely out of bowshot. They noticed Sonny among the Terrans and pointed at him. Sonny noticed that. He unobtrusively picked up a double-bitted axe and kept it at hand. He and Mom had lunch with the contact team. As they showed no ill effects from breakfast, Fayon decided that it was safe to let them have anything the Terrans ate or drank. They liked wine. They knew what it was all right but this seemed to have a delightfully different flavor. They each tried a cigarette, choked over the first few puffs, and decided that they didn't like smoking. Mom gave us a lot of information, as far as she could, on the crops and animals. The big things, the size of rhinoceroses, are draft animals and nothing else. They're not eaten, Dorver said. I don't know whether the meat isn't good or is taboo or they are too valuable to eat. They eat all the other three species and milk two of them. I have an idea they grind their grain in big stone mortars as needed. That was right. He'd seen things like that. Willie, when you're over in the mountains, see if you can find something we can make millstones out of. We can shape them with sono cutters. After they get the idea, they can do it themselves by hand. One of those big animals could be used to turn the mill. Uh, did you get any words from her? Paul Millard shook his head gloomily. Nothing we can be sure of. It was the same thing as in the village yesterday. She'd say something, I'd repeat it, and she'd tell us it was wrong and say the same thing over again. Lillian took recordings. She got the same results as last night. Ask her about it later. She has the same effect on Mom as on the others? Yes. Mom was very polite and tried not to show it, but— Lillian took him aside, out of earshot of the two savants, after lunch. She was almost distracted. "'Mark, I don't know what I'm going to do. She's like the others. Every time I open my mouth in front of her, she's simply horrified. It's as though my voice does something loathsome to her, and I'm the one who's supposed to learn to talk to them. "'Well, those who can do and those who can't teach,' he told her. You can study recordings and tell us what the words are and teach us how to recognize and pronounce them. You're the only linguist we have." That seemed to comfort her a little. He hoped it would work out that way. If they could communicate with these people and did leave a party here to prepare for the first colonization, he'd stay on to teach the natives Terran technologies and to study theirs. He'd been expecting that Lillian would stay, too. She was the linguist. She'd have to stay. But now, if it turned out that she would be of no help but a liability, she'd go back with the Hubert Penrose. Paul wouldn't keep a linguist who offended the natives' every sensibility with every word she spoke. He didn't want that to happen. Lillian and he had come to mean a little too much to each other to be parted now. Paul Millard and Carl Dorver had considerable difficulty with Mom that afternoon. They wanted her to go with them and help trade for cattle. Mom didn't want to. She was afraid. 
They had to do a lot of play-acting, with a half-dozen marines pretending to guard her with fixed bayonets from some of Dave Crestle's Navy construction men who had red bandanas on their heads to simulate combs before she got the idea. Then she was afraid to get into the contragravity lorry that was to carry the boxes and the wagon wheels. Sonny managed to reassure her and insisted on going along, and he insisted on taking his axe with him. That meant doubling the guard to make sure Sonny didn't lose his self-control when he saw his former persecutors within chopping distance. It went off much better than either Paul Millard or Louis Scofredo expected. After the first shock of being airborne had worn off, Mom found that she liked contragravity riding. Sonny was wildly delighted with it from the start. The natives showed neither of them any hostility. Mom's lavender bathrobe and Sonny's green coveralls and big axe seemed to be symbols of a new and exalted status. Even the Lord Mayor was extremely polite to them. The Lord Mayor and half a dozen others got a contragravity ride, too, to the meadows to pick out cattle. A dozen animals, including a pair of the two-ton draft beasts, were driven to the Terran camp. A couple of lorry loads of assorted vegetables were brought in, too. Everybody seemed very happy about the deal, especially Bennett Fayon. He wanted to slaughter one of the sheep-sized meat and milk animals at once and get to work on it. Gofredo advised him to put it off till the next morning. He wanted a large native audience to see the animal being shot with a rifle. The water tower was finished, and the big spherical tank hoisted on top of it and made fast. A pump and a filter system were installed. There was no water for hot showers that evening, though. They would have to run a pipeline to the river, and that would entail a ditch that would cut through several cultivated fields, which in turn would provoke an uproar. Paul Millard didn't want that happening until he'd concluded the cattle trade. Charlie Logren and Willie Schellenmacher had gone up to the ship on one of the landing craft. They accompanied the landing party that went down into the mountains. Ayesha Keithley arrived late in the afternoon on another landing craft, with five or six tons of instruments and parts and equipment, and a male Navy warrant officer helper. They looked around the lab Lillian had been using at one end of the headquarters hut. "'This won't do,' the girl Navy officer said. We can't get a quarter of the apparatus we're going to need in here. We'll have to build something." Dave Crustle was drawn into the discussion. Yes, he could put up something big enough for everything the girls would need to install, and soundproof it. Concrete, he decided. They'd have to wait till he got the water line down and the pump going, though. There was a crowd of natives in the fields, gaping at the Terran camp the next morning and Gofredo decided to kill the animal. Until they learned the native name, they were calling it Domesticated Type C. It was herded out where everyone could watch, and a Marine stepped forward, unslung his rifle, took a kneeling position, and aimed at it. It was a hundred and fifty yards away. Mom had come out to see what was going on. Sonny and Howell, who had been consulting by signs over the construction of a wagon, were standing side by side. The Marine squeezed his trigger. The rifle banged, and the domesticated sea bounded into the air, dropped and kicked a few times, and was still. The natives, however, missed that part of it. They were howling piteously and rubbing their heads. All but Sonny. He was just mildly surprised at what had happened to the Dom Sea. Sonny? it would appear, was stone deaf. As anticipated, there was another uproar later in the morning when the ditching machine started north across the meadow. A mob of savants, seeing its relentless progress toward a field of something like turnips, gathered in front of it, twittering and brandishing implements of agriculture, many of them Terran-made. Paul Millard was ready for this. Two lorries went out, one loaded with marines, who jumped off with their rifles ready. By this time all the savants knew what rifles would do besides make a noise. 
Millard, Darver, Gofredo, and a few others got out of the other vehicle and unloaded presents. Gofredo did the talking. The savants couldn't understand him, but they liked it. They also liked the presents, which included a dozen empty half-gallon rum demijohns, tarpaulins, and a lot of assorted knick-knacks. The pipeline went through. He and Sonny got the forge set up. There was no fuel for it. A party of marines had gone out to the east to cut wood. When they got back, they burnt some charcoal in the pit that had been dug beside the camp. Until then, he and Sonny were drawing plans for a wooden wheel with a metal tire when Lillian came out of the headquarters hut with a clipboard under her arm. She motioned to him. Come on over, he told her. You can talk in front of Sonny. He won't mind. He can't hear. Can't hear? she echoed. You mean— That's right. Sonny's stone deaf. He didn't even hear that rifle going off. The only one of this gang that has brains enough to pour sand out of a boot with the directions on the bottom of the heel, and he's a total linguistic loss. So he isn't a half-wit after all. He's got an IQ close to genius level. Look at this. He never saw a wheel before yesterday. Now he's designing one. Lillian's eyes widened. So that's why Mom's so sharp about sign talk. She's been doing it all his life. Then she remembered what she had come out to show him, and held out the clipboard. You know how that analyzer of mine works? Well, here's what Ayesha's going to do. After breaking a sound into frequency bands, instead of being photographed and projected, each band goes to an analyzer of its own and is projected on its own screen. There will be forty of them, each for a band of a hundred cycles, from zero to four thousand. That seems to be the Svant vocal range. The diagram passed from hand to hand during cocktail time before dinner. Bennett Fayol had been working all day dissecting the animal they were all calling a dumb sea, a name which would stick even if and when they learned the native name. He glanced disinterestedly at the drawing, then looked again more closely. Then he set down the drink he was holding in his other hand and studied it intently. "'You know what you have here?' he asked. "'This is a very close analogy to the hearing organs of that animal I was working on. The comb, as we've assumed, is the external organ. It's covered with small flaps and fissures. Back of each fissure is a long, narrow membrane. They're paired, one on each side of the comb, and from them nerves lead to clusters of small round membranes. Nerves lead from them to a complex nerve cable at the bottom of the comb, and into the brain at the base of the skull. I couldn't understand how the system functioned, but now I see it. Each of the larger membranes on the outside responds to a sound frequency band, and the small ones on the inside break the bands down to individual frequencies. How many of the little ones are there? Ayesha asked. Thousands of them. The inner comb is simply packed with them. Wait, I'll show you. He rose and went away, returning with a sheaf of photo enlargements and a number of blocks of lucite in which specimens were mounted. Everybody examined them. Anna de Jong, as a practicing psychologist, had an M.D., and to get that she'd had to know a modicum of anatomy. She was puzzled. I can't understand how they hear with those things. I'll grant that the membranes will respond to sound, but I can't see how they transmit it. But they do hear, Millard said. Their musical instruments, their reactions to our voices, the way they are affected by sounds like gunfire? They hear, but they don't hear in the same way we do, Fayon replied. If you can't be convinced by anything else, look at these things, and compare them with the structure of the human ear or the ear of any member of any other sapient race we've ever contacted. That's what I've been saying from the beginning. They have sound perception to an extent that makes ours look almost like deafness. Ayesha Keithley said. I wish I could design a sound detector one-tenth as good as this must be. 
Yes, the way the Lord Mayor said Fwunk, and the way Paul Millard said it sounded entirely different to them. Of course, Fwunk and Pwink and Tweet and Kush sound alike to them, but let's don't be too picky about things. End of Part 4